welcome to taking care of mom and dad. 70 million baby boomers are entering the golden years. Unfortunately, those golden years also bring with them serious health, psychological, and emotional challenges. And life becomes complicated in a different way. At this time, the children often become the caregivers. Sometimes they live close by. At other times, they live too far away to be available on call. They have to get the answers to many questions quickly. What is really going on with mom? What are the treatment options? How will this be paid for? How can I manage all of this from far away? These questions and others create uncertainty, fear, and even guilt. Taking Care of Mom and Dad was created to answer these questions and many others. On each episode, experts in healthcare, elder care, finance, law, and psychology focus on the specific questions you want answered. Today, I'm happy to introduce you to our professionals who are going to share very important information with us. First, we have in the studio, Dr. Rich Rogan, DC. He is a chiropractic physician. So Dr. Rogan, what role does chiropractic medicine play in the elder care sphere? I really see this as a two-part question. The first part, it's really important to note that Medicare, a federal insurance program for the elderly, is a covered benefit for chiropractic care. A lot of seniors are unaware of this. They have tough choices to make with their finances. They're on a fixed income. And a lot of them don't get the care that they need because they're making these tough choices. So with Medicare, when they turn 65, they have access to chiropractic coverage. Right. Their Medicare covers 80%, mm -hmm. and their supplemental insurance will cover the other 20%. So they are actually paid in full. Okay, so you mentioned supplemental insurance. I'm not sure everybody really has that. So how do they make a decision about that, and, and what are the consequences of not having it? That's true. Not everybody has a supplemental insurance. Okay. So it really behooves them to weigh their costs. Mm -hmm. It depends on if they have a lot of doctors and a lot of health care challenges. It would probably be likely a better situation for them to have the supplemental coverage. But they really do have to weigh those costs. Okay. The second part to that question is chiropractic absolutely has a big role in helping the elderly. Uh, the elderly have mobility issues. They have a lot of aches and pains and chiropractic is uh, really well positioned to help restore mobility, range of motion. It actually helps uh, with alignment of the spine. That creates uh, more symmetry for the muscles. Oftentimes, we've all felt that situation where we have a tug of war going on with our muscles. The chiropractic adjustments and treatments will bring more symmetry and balance to that. What are the major issues that present themselves when an elderly person walks into your office? The biggest thing by far is uh, overwhelmingly arthritis. Uh, most seniors have arthritis uh, to some degree or another, some more than others. But uh, chiropractic does a great job with uh, helping those arthritic type pains. While it's not a cure for arthritis, it can help again with range of motion issues and helping uh, them feel a little spring in their step and a little younger. Okay. What are the major issues that they come to complain about that are real issues and what are actually more psychosomatic issues? Statistically, the, the biggest reason for someone to contact a chiropractor would be low back pain. Okay. Uh, second to that would be neck pain and headaches, shoulder pains, any kind of musculoskeletal pains that emanate from the spine. I can speak from personal experience. Hip issues, why are they so prevalent? They're often prevalent because of an alignment issue. So they're secondary to pelvic alignment. Pelvic alignment is crucial to the hip function. If the pelvis is out of alignment, it'll put undue pressure on the hip and cause premature wear and tear, i.e. arthritis. So the analogy I often use is our automobiles. When our car is out of alignment, we'll often notice that one tire will wear down prematurely than the other. The same thing happens in our bodies. When the pelvis is out of alignment, one hip will wear down faster than the other. I know many people opt for hip surgery, hip replacements. Are there other alternatives rather than that? I see this as another two-part question. If somebody needs surgery, they've had the imaging done, it shows bone on bone, that's imperative that they get that surgery. But many people want to table that surgery or delay it for some time. 
So the options would be uh, chiropractic services, i.e. spinal adjustments and, and manipulation, uh, physical therapy type things like stretches and exercises have merit. Also, uh, many seniors will see massage therapists, acupuncturists. The other side to that would be um, supplements. Uh, there are many joint type supplements available too, like glucosamine, chondroitin, MSM, hyaluronic acid, just to name a few. Anti-inflammatory herbs have merit. Some of those that come to mind are boswellia and turmeric. Those are anti-inflammatory type herbs that are helpful with uh, pain mitigation. So these treatments you're speaking of, are these basically deferring the inevitable or can they actually have somebody never need hip surgery? Well, it really depends, again, on the imaging. If the imaging shows total loss of joint space, bone on bone, no space left, it's just a, a, a avoiding the inevitable. So they will absolutely need hip surgery at some point. Many people just want to delay that, though. They want to schedule that for next summer or for two years from now. So those other alternative things that we just, just spoke about are things that they can do to delay that. Is there a connection between the spine and brain health? There absolutely is. Uh, back to the anatomy lesson here again. We have the brain that sits up top in our skull mm -hmm. and the, the spinal cord comes down. As an extension of the brain feeding the spinal cord is the brain stem. That okay. brain stem exits the foramen magnum in the back of the head and extends down anatomically to the level of C1 and C2, the top two vertebrae. So alignment issues at C1 and C2 can actually put pressure on the brain stem. When that happens, we've all noticed that feeling where we get what I call brain fog. You feel a little dazed and confused. You feel a little bit out of it. You're not sharp. You're not focused. You might even be a little bit headachy. You might have a little dizzy feeling. So chiropractic adjustments to that upper neck area can take the pressure off that brain stem. Okay. And the caregivers, often they're the children, and they're in another city. And now symptoms are occurring. How do they know whether they should be seeing a chiropractor or it's time to see the physician? Well, seeing both certainly has merit, but chiropractic doctors are well trained to make the proper referrals. If we feel that it's something that we cannot help, we have an obligation to refer out to the appropriate professional. I don't know that everybody really knew that you could make those kind of referrals out or that you had the capability of doing that. That's, some, that's news to me. Uh, is that part of the training as a chiropractic physician? It is. Our training is okay. very extensive and our training includes the fact that we can order imaging, we can order blood work, we can order any kind of lab work, uh, we can make referrals to um, any other professional. Good to know. You've been very interesting here. We hope to have you back on a future show. Thank you. Thank you for having me today. How can people reach you? Um, I'm easily reached by email. And the email is drrichrogan at gmail.com. That's D-R-R-I-C-H-R-O-G-A-N at gmail.com. Or by phone, 941-752-3352. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's really my pleasure to introduce you to Lou Pirro of the Pirro Law Group. He's going to tell us a lot about long-term care coverage, Medicaid, and qualifying for Medicaid. The costs for assisted living, nursing homes, and other forms of care are skyrocketing. Can you comment about that? The cost of health care in general, Bruce, is going up. It's now 17 or 18 percent of our gross domestic product, and a large part of that is the cost of care that's incurred by people later in life. They say 68% of healthcare costs are incurred after your 65th birthday. And so part of those costs are nursing homes, assisted living facilities, and home health care. And the issues become where do you find the available caregivers? How do you pay for all of that? And the costs keep driving up. We're looking at nursing home costs nationally, somewhere in the eight to $18,000 per month range. When you look at assisted living, 3,000 a month to 10,000 a month, depending upon where you live. I, we happen to be here in New York City, and in New York City, an assisted living facility is up in the $10,000 range, and nursing homes close to 16, 17,000. So people say, well, I'm gonna be at home, I'm never gonna go to a nursing home, and that's a, a laudable goal. But even if you're at home, we have many clients now, if you do the math, and you're getting 24 hour a day care in home, help with things like bathing, dressing, toileting, transferring, 
and you look at the care, and if it's agency care, it's in the $22 to $25 an hour range, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, you're up over $200,000 per year for 24-7 in-home care. And that breaks the banks in a lot of families very, very rapidly if they haven't done any planning. I know that one of the ways to cover these costs is long-term care insurance. Tell us about that. Long-term care insurance is a policy that is totally separate from health insurance. So you can't confuse it with Medicare. Medicare is something that everyone gets at age 65, part A, you pay a premium for part B, but it's mainly doctors and hospitals. There's a broad misconception that Medicare will cover long-term care when that need arises. It will not. It does not have a long-term care component at this point in time. So you're generally on your own. A long-term care insurance policy is a standalone policy which covers nursing homes, assisted living, and home health care. There are different levels of benefits. You buy it typically on a daily benefit basis. So whatever the cost of care is in your region, you want to look at that and you want to say, okay, I have X dollars of income. I need Y dollars from a long-term care policy to supplement that. In the event that I do need long-term care, that will allow me to private pay and to cover those expenses without depleting your assets. You have coverage periods, three years, five years. Once upon a time, there were longer benefits, lifetime benefits, and much richer policies, but the long-term care insurance industry has had some issues. And right now, there are some great companies still selling product. It's a great thing to have when the time comes you don't want to be the person with the house on fire without homeowner's insurance. And when you need long-term care, having an insurance policy that covers those daily benefits at home or assisted living or nursing home are going to stand you in good stead. I understand that long-term care insurance has undergone some changes. What are those? Long-term care in the insurance world is a relatively new product. It really didn't even become popular until the 1980s and really the 1990s. When those policies were designed, they made certain assumptions. And one of the assumptions was that they would have interest rates that could support income for the pool of money that they collect. And the interest rates back then were in the double digits. Well, if you remember what happened in 2008, 9, 10, interest rates plummeted and stayed that way for about 10 years. And so insurance companies couldn't earn money on the pool that they had in reserve. And the other assumption that was the key one was they assumed that people would let their policies lapse. They call it a lapse rate. And they assumed that 5% of purchasers would lapse their policies. The experience was more like 1%. So what that meant was the insurance companies had all of this risk on the books. They had money sitting in the bank in their escrow accounts that they couldn't earn money on because of the low interest rates and they, they are prohibited from any other investments. And so premium increases became necessary as we got into 2010 and beyond. And a lot of the people that we represent, and we do a lot of claims work and, and representation with regard to long-term care insurance in our law firm, they have had premium increases that have put them in real serious binds because if you're counting on $2,000 a, a year as your premium, and all of a sudden it's three or $4,000 a year, that changes your budget. And the affordability of the policies has become an issue for a lot of people that really has spooked the market. And a lot of companies, we used to have over 100 companies selling long-term care insurance. We're down to about 10. Now, that said, there are still good products out there in the marketplace. The premiums have gone up, so we believe now they are priced accordingly. And actually, the Society of Actuaries did a study saying they believe the policies are now priced accordingly because of the experience and, and the history that the companies have. So we're hopeful that the long-term care insurance market can make a rebound, but there are still some good policies out there that can be purchased. And again, when the time comes <clears throat> that you need care, having insurance in your portfolio is a tremendous benefit and it relieves a lot of the anxiety and stress that people face when all of a sudden that illness or accident occurs and you need long-term care. Lou, are there any other insurance options? As the long-term care market has taken a downturn, life insurance products have adapted and companies are very resilient. So what they've done is they've taken traditional life insurance and that could be a whole life policy, a variable policy, a guaranteed universal life policy or universal life. 
I guess one company, not in New York, but in other, other parts of the country, actually does term insurance with a rider. And what happens is you put a rider on that policy that allows you to access the death benefit early to pay for long-term care. It's a really good concept. And these policies have taken off and they've become extremely popular. They generally are in two varieties. One is a single premium where you put in a lump sum of money. We call it idle cash, money that you're not otherwise using or counting on. You can invest. And let's say that you're 65 years old, you put $100,000 into a policy. That's going to give you two benefits. One is a death benefit. And that's generally about 2x or double. So you'd get a death benefit of 200,000. So if you never need long-term care, your beneficiaries are going to get 200,000 instead of the original 100. And you get a long-term care benefit. And that's generally roughly 5x. And that's about 500,000. That if you need long-term care during your lifetime, you'd have about $500,000 of benefit to pay for long-term care. So that's a pretty good investment. And there is a return on that investment. Somebody's going to get paid, either you during your lifetime or your beneficiaries. The other are traditional long-term or traditional life policies where you're paying an annual premium. And when you pay an annual premium, you get coverage for that year. Could be again whole life. So you may have some cash buildup, but it doesn't have to be. And most of the clients we work with are purchasing guaranteed universal policies, which means no cash buildup. So you pay an annual premium. Let's say you buy a $300,000 death benefit. You can take, depending upon the company and the policy, between 2 and 4% of that policy per month. So if it's $300,000 and you're at 2%, you would get $6,000 per month to pay for long-term care expenses. And that comes out as tax-free cash. You can get right now up to about $11,500 per month. That's about the maximum benefit for an indemnity policy. But $11,500 of cash in most parts of the country combined with your income is going to be a tremendous defense against those costs of long-term care. And again, the objection to buying insurance for long-term care for a lot of people was, I could pay premium for 30 years and never see a benefit. But if it's life insurance, somebody will. Your beneficiaries are going to reap the benefits of that death benefit if you never need long-term care during your lifetime. At what age should people acquire policies? Well, that, that's a tricky question. And I'm an estate planner, so people very often say, well, when should I do a will? And my curt answer is, tell me the day you're going to die, and I'll have you come in the day before. We'll be very efficient. So you should buy an insurance policy before you have the need for the coverage because there is underwriting. You have to be insurable. So what that leads you to, to is that the younger you buy the policy, the better chance you have of getting the coverage. Many of the companies don't go beyond age 75. I don't think any company goes beyond age 80. And where most of the policies for long-term care insurance are being sold now are in the late 50s. The average age of purchase, not the high or low, but the average, is 57. So a lot of people are looking at this in their 40s and 50s. Some wait until their 60s and 70s. If you're in your 80s, it's too late. But the sooner you get in, the better. The option that I mentioned earlier, the life insurance with the rider, if you're a person who's in that generation where you have children that are going to have to go to college, you need life insurance. You may have parents who are aging out. You may have to take care of them. And you want to put a plan in place so that when you get to that age, when you're in your 80s, 90s, 100s, you have the coverage that you need. So you can buy the life insurance policy to cover your current needs, whether it be education of your children or income replacement if you die prematurely or you can have it and say, I'm going to use this for long-term care in the event that I become disabled. And Bruce, about a third of the people who have disabilities and need long-term care are under age 65. So having that policy in your portfolio early gives you coverage regardless of how this happens or when. Does everybody qualify for long-term care coverage? Uh, life insurance and long-term care insurance are both underwritten. So you have to go through a process. You have to be healthy enough to get the coverage. With life insurance, you may get rated. If you have a pre-existing condition, they may say that we're going to give you coverage, but you're going to pay more in premium. Same for long-term care insurance. So everyone cannot get coverage. And we have a lot of clients that come to us very disgruntled because they went to buy the insurance. They went through the underwriting process and something kicked up that they hadn't even realized would be 
a, a condition that rendered them uninsurable, and now they're scrambling because they can't get the coverage. Um, I think it was John F. Kennedy that said, the time to fix the roof is when the sun is shining. You don't want to wait till it's raining to try to go buy a policy. You don't buy homeowner's insurance when your house is on fire. And you don't buy long-term care or life insurance when you've been diagnosed with a chronic illness. Uh, so it's something that you want to get done before that event happens. Lou, what are the costs of coverage? It varies based upon age, the amount of coverage. So there are a lot of variables. And the number one objection to buying long-term care insurance is that it's too expensive. But relative to what? If your cost of care is going to be $10,000, $12,000, $15,000 per month, and you have a policy that's going to allow you to cover that without depleting your assets, what's the value of that policy? Some states have tax programs like New York where you actually get a tax credit, 20% for buying long-term care insurance. There are federal deductions available on a more limited basis, but you have to look at your own tax picture to see if you can take advantage of those. And look at what your budget is. What can you afford? For many people, we combine policies with trusts. So you don't buy 100% of the coverage. You buy a piece of the coverage so that if you're at home or you're in assisted living, you have insurance that's going to give you flexibility. And the two keys here are that you want access to care and you want the choice of providers or settings that you receive that care in. And insurance is your best bet to do that. Again, this is not a Medicare reimbursed expense. Your Medicare supplement policy isn't going to pay for this. So it comes down to two choices and it's almost a Hobson's choice. You either buy the insurance or you rely on Medicaid. And we'll talk about that more later. How much insurance is enough? When we're working with clients and they're shopping for, for policies, and we're not licensed, so we don't sell product, we don't get compensated, we don't get commissioned on any of this, but we do provide advice. We provide counsel to clients on how to structure a plan and how to buy a policy. And what we look first at is what do you have in terms of income and assets? And we look at your IRA. If you're not yet 70 and a half, and at some point at 70 and a half, you're going to have to start taking required minimum distributions, that gets factored into the equation. What is your social security? Do you have a pension? What are your dividend and interest income? Do you have any other income sources? And then look at the cost of care in your area. So if you determine wherever you're living that it's $12,000 a month, and that's what you would need to cover if you needed care, and you have income of $5,000 a month, then your appropriate coverage level would be seven because you don't need to insure the full 12. You could contribute five, but you want to have the ability to cover that other 7,000 that you're short in a long-term care policy. So it comes down to financial planning and legal planning in tandem to come up with the right number. And it isn't a one size fits all. This is really customized to your particular needs. What companies are currently offering the coverage? Well, one company that has pulled back on their coverage, and they're, they're not delivering it through the normal channels any longer, is Genworth, which was one of the major carriers. Many of the large carriers have gone out of business, so the leaders now are Mutual of Omaha, Transamerica, uh, and there are several others, but again, we only have about 10 companies that are offering coverage, and this varies state by state. There are policies and we practice primarily in New York, although we're in Florida and Massachusetts, New Jersey, the policies are different in each state and companies write policies in different states. So you have to look at where you are. Your best bet is to find a highly qualified long-term care specialist. You don't want a generalist, you want someone who does long-term care and knows the products inside and out and represents multiple companies. So they will meet with you, they'll talk to you, work with your attorney, work with your financial advisor who may have access to this coverage. And the only way to truly know what you're gonna get is to look at every company that's available in your state, go through the underwriting process, get an offer from a company that you like the policy, and then you can make a decision from there once you determine what the premiums are for the coverage that you determine that you need. So it isn't a purchase that, like you're going to the grocery store, and you're, you're picking up a gallon of milk. This is something that you really have to work towards to get a solution that's a policy that fits your particular needs and meets your, your expectations. 
Lou, thank you very much. You've been very informative. Rodney Sedholm is an attorney with a great deal of experience in this topic. Hello, Rania. Welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me here, Bruce. Rodney, there are a lot of concerns when a family member finds out that a loved one is being diagnosed with dementia. Can you give us a list of what should be done? Sure, Bruce. This is a usually a very painful time for all families. And unfortunately, the statistics are showing that there are more and more families that are affected and that are going to be affected by this disease. So the first thing that you need to do is know where all the assets are. It is not unheard of in this day and age that one spouse is taking care of all the finances. Doesn't mean it's the man or the woman, but usually one spouse. And the other spouse has no idea where any of the assets are except the daily you know, bank account that they both use to pay bills. So the first thing is find out where all of the assets reside. Very, very important. Then the second thing is decide who in the family, it could be the spouse, the children, brothers. I mean, that's really up to each family member. There has to be a great level of trust when you're um, you know, undertaking because you're telling everybody where all the money is and they may not know. So the second thing is determine who's going to be in charge of those assets. It could all be one person. All of the assets are going to one person to be in charge of. It could be shared. To the extent possible, while the family member is still lucid, have them be part of the conversation. This is very, very important legally because if it's determined based upon the assets that you have, that the assets should be put in a trust, then the attorney who's drafting the trust and who is going to have witnesses come and sign the trust, they, everyone in that room needs to be certain that the individual is okay proceeding as set forth in the trust. So have the family member who is ill be a part of the decision making to the extent that you can, depending on where they are in the disease when you find out that they have dementia or Alzheimer's. So you have a list of all the assets, including where, th where they're located. I don't just mean money at X bank. I also mean real estate here and there, cars here and there, etc. Maybe there's a stamp collection that's worth something. Who knows? Then who's going to be in charge of those assets? Here you have, you know, a whole litany of things that you can do. You can have someone be, you know, a joint owner of the asset. You can put all the assets in a trust. That's irrevocable. So the individual who is ill, you know, doesn't control them anymore, but can still use them and enjoy them to the extent that they can, they're healthy enough to do that. I mean, there's a whole host of options with what you can do with the assets, but first decide who's going to be in charge of what. Another thing that should be done almost immediately is get a power of attorney completed. Determine who is going to make financial decisions right now alongside this individual. Because unfortunately, people with dementia often have strokes. And depending on the level of their stroke and how bad it is, they may not be able to make many decisions after that. They may not be able to care for themselves. And someone needs access to the money today to help pay bills and to make other financial decisions on behalf of the person. The next thing is the healthcare proxy. Who is going to decide what happens to this individual's healthcare if the person cannot answer for themselves? And here it's very important to talk to the person and find out what it is that they wish to do. Do they want to be resuscitated or not? Do they want to be fed through a feeding tube or not? These are very ugly conversations, but they're very important to have because once the person enters the hospital, if the person is not married, the hospital is not simply going to speak to the person who's there. In New York, if you're a spouse, 
they will speak to you and they'll ask you for your opinion. But if you're a daughter or a son, they may not. So it's very important to have that document prepared as well. So you have some kind of list of assets and determine with your lawyer what to do with that, healthcare proxy, and also a power of attorney. And then the most morbid of it all is if you do not have a place for this person after they're no longer here, you need to find that place. Whether you need um, to bury the person or cremate the person, you need to start thinking about it because sometimes it's not so easy to find that space. New York, for example, is crowded. I was surprised when I went to buy a spot that there were only two left in the cemetery. And a lot of the cemeteries that I called said there was no room. Literally, there is no room. So don't discount that morbid yet very important step. Thank you very much. This has been really interesting. This has been Taking Care of Mom and Dad. I hope you've learned something today, and I hope you'll tune in again for a future episode. Thank you very much for joining us.